Yeah, <laughs> embarrassing. Whew, that was among the more embarrassing introductions that I've had done on this little book tour. Um, thank you, Doug. I'm so thrilled to be back at Mayo, and I, was, I got to meet all morning with people who are working and thinking in this space on Mayo's behalf, and I just remembered, like, wow, this is just a place where I am among such like-minded people, and I feel like your kindred spirit, so it's nice to be in what I hope is a friendly room. Back in Boston, a lot of this stuff is much harder to kind of talk about and get through, in part because we're just so heavily medicalized with so many hospitals and so much competition, so it's really refreshing to be here, and I'm thrilled. I'm going to dive right in because I think I have just about a half hour of material, and I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to chat, so with no further ado. Everyone laughs because I've been in school for so long and I'm continuing to be in school, but one thing that doesn't usually get mentioned is that back at Yale as an undergrad, my degree was in the history of science and history of medicine. So I got here yesterday to Mayo and wonderfully, when I got to my hotel room, I had this little book of aphorisms from the Mayo brothers, which I don't know if any of you have seen this, but if you haven't, you should pick it up because it's a great read. Um, and so I sat there last night kind of flipping through, and I found two quotes that I thought really were representative of where I wanted to take the talk today. So the first is, and you know, these aphorisms are all commenting like big picture medicine stuff. They're both from William. The first is, the aim of medicine is to prevent disease and prolong life. The, the ideal of medicine is to eliminate the need for a physician. So this you can imagine, like this is singing my song. I'm sitting there reading this book. I'm like, man, I should just move to Minnesota. This is perfect. Then I keep reading, keep reading. And sure enough, then I come across this. We have never been allowed to lose sight of the fact that the main purpose to be served by the clinic is the care of the sick. And so I thought that this was a really nice entree into this talk today because I think it illuminates a tension that so many hospitals are feeling right now and the healthcare sector generally is really struggling with. My sense is that Mayo, in many cases, if the folks that I met with this morning are any, rep any representation, has really moved more towards the quote on the left, right? This more holistic idea of what health is and what the role of the clinic is in the community's lives. But I think for many, many hospitals, particularly smaller hospitals, community hospitals, they're still kind of wrenched over this. They know that, like, in an ideal world, medicine is to prevent disease and support health creation. And yet the business models and the training and everything that's caught up in the institution of a hospital or a clinic, any health service delivery sector organization, is really in this model of when you're sick, come see us and we'll do something and then we'll kind of mend you back up and send you out. So I just wanted to frame this up as something that I think is alive in Mayo's history and we'll come back to this at the end to ask, which is it and can it be both at one time? So the structure for today. I thought we would try and do four things. One is I'll try and shed some insight on why I think and we, the royal we, might think that social services are really important in producing health. So I've got some interesting, I think, empirical data to share with you on that, some of which was published in the book and some of which is brand new and just under review now as a new peer review paper. Second, I thought we could talk a little bit about how can they, they being social services, be integrated with social services? What does that functionally look like? And I can tell you a little bit about what I know of the case base that's emerging and the evidence base that's emerging for small scale interventions that are doing this work. And then we can dive a little bit more deeply into a real case from Santa Monica that I know pretty well. And I've got a video, so you'll get like 90 whole seconds without my voice in the next half hour. And then third, I thought we could talk about, so why would a health provider consider integrating, and this does get to the ROI question, which, you know, back in January when I was thinking I'm going to come to Mayo, I thought, wow, what's really the cutting edge question? I was like, the cutting edge question is definitely for me, what's the business case? And then as I started to really do the work, I was like, oh man, business case isn't very strong, but we can talk about all the complexities around the business case and the different kind of features of what might go into the consideration of whether or not a provider wanted to partner with a homeless shelter or a food pantry or the schools in really systematic ways. And then I've got three questions at the end that I hoped would tee us up for discussion. And I would just say on these, I think they are the three most alive questions for me right now in the debate. So, you know, sometimes you end with questions just because you think no one's going to talk, but um, I really am eager to kind of learn from you and continue to hear more on the conversation about what does the future of healthcare hold. Sound okay? You're all eating, you're happy, it's fine. All right, 
So this is the book, The American Healthcare Paradox, and I just like to use this opportunity to acknowledge the fact that the book was co-authored, right? So I am one half of this picture. The other half is Dr. Elizabeth Bradley. She's stationed at Yale School of Public Health, and she has been a tremendous mentor, professor, boss, colleague, partner. And um, so I always like to show this picture. She brings to the work an incredible wealth of knowledge and expertise and time spent in the field, including a background in economics. And this is really representative of what I think I might most have brought to the partnership, which was when we went to cities to investigate their health system. This was Stockholm. I found fun bars to go to. So this was an ice bar. And you can't imagine how uncomfortable she was in an ice bar. She's like a very quintessential academic. I said, oh, it'll be great. So that's us in an ice bar in Stockholm. And so this is the paper that really started the whole book experience. It's a paper in BMJ Quality and Safety that Betsy Lead authored back in 2010. And I'm going to walk you through the analysis now because it really did provide the bedrock. It's chapter one of the book, and it's really what has gained a lot of traction, particularly among policymakers and healthcare administrators who really like to see the quantitative data. So this is the quantitative data, in my mind, that makes a strong case for why social services are very important in managing population health. This is the graph that we've all seen a thousand times, right? It's been on the cover of every major newspaper. And when people generally like to talk about why the healthcare system maybe is not functioning optimally, they usually point to something like this. This is all of the OECD countries on the x-axis. That's Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And then you have percent of their GDP, gross domestic products, spent on healthcare on the y-axis. And you'll see the US is huge, right? We're 18% whereas the OECD average is somewhere between 10 and 12. These are 2009 numbers, but I would note that they haven't changed much, in part because of the recession and maybe because of the ACA. We've stayed right around 18% for several years now. And this, you know, it's a lot of GDP, and you could worry about crowd out. But the real concern with this is that what are we getting for this health, right? And it will come as no surprise to people in this room, I'm sure, we're not getting great things all the time. We get some great things. There are some areas where I would never want to take away from the US healthcare system when it does well. You want organ transplant, you want an MRI, you want knee replacement, you want these kinds of procedures that high volume makes better. Awesome. We are where you want to be, there's no doubt about it. But coming from a public health perspective, if you look at some of these larger population health metrics, we really flounder. So again, there were 34 OECD countries, and this is our ranking within the OECD on these three kind of key indicators. Maternal mortality were 25th, life expectancy were 26th, low birth weight were 28th. Sometimes I present this data, and I'll get the pushback that, well, Lauren, those are all industrialized countries, so how bad is bad, right? I mean, if you're 28th, but we're talking all Western Europe, Maybe the margins are small, and it's not that big a deal. So on the bottom of this slide, I always just put the ranking of the US in the world. So out of all 283, I think, countries it is now that the CIA World Factbook uses. On maternal mortality, we are 136. And I think maybe more importantly, our neighbors are Iran and Hungary. Life expectancy, we look a little better, coming in just behind Finland, but still just one spot above Turks and Caicos. And low birth weight infants, we are a paltry, in my opinion, 169th sandwich right between Guam and Croatia. So this is kind of the motivation, right, for the study and for further interrogation. I think we've operated for a long time on this idea that healthcare and health are virtually synonymous, and so Americans have really accepted and embraced high healthcare spending, thinking that it will beget us good population health, and yet we're seeing that doesn't really work. Coming from a public health perspective, though, and I'm sure others in the room share this one, there is good reason to believe that that thinking that healthcare and health are almost synonymous is probably pretty flawed, right? And so this statistic has gotten a lot of play recently because I feel like we're in this kind of zeitgeist moment where social and behavioral and environmental determinants are getting a lot of traction. And so this statistic is what actually determines health, and it is derived from empirical studies. Um, and the answer is a lot more than your health care, right? So you can break it out into a number of different factors and frameworks, but here I've just done three. You've got health care, you've got genetics, and then you've got this big kind of bucket that is the social, environmental, behavioral stuff. And health care really is about 20%. It sometimes it's reported as 10, sometimes as 15. I've never seen it reported as more than 20, so I think I'm being as generous as I can be here based on the data. Genetics, about another 20%. 
And it's really interesting when this work started to be done, people would report genetics as 20% and then quickly write that bucket off and kind of move on and say, well, there's nothing we can do about genetics, so let's focus on these other things. And now we're coming to a new place where we understand, of course, that genetics may be more modifiable than we thought it once was. But most importantly, then, we have this big swath left. Everything, 100 minus 40, we've got 60% of our health that we think is really determined by these social, environmental, and behavioral factors. And so if we think back to this um, idea that, oh, we're spending so much on healthcare and we're not getting great health, health outcomes, Betsy and I, as researchers, said, well, wouldn't it be interesting if somehow we could build into the analysis something that represents the work that any country or any state does in that orange box? So that was the goal. That was the framing. And the answer is you can build that in, or you can at least build a proxy in. So if you look at the OECD data, they've got one column. They do a nice job cleaning and prepping and sharing all of their data. They've got one column that's health service spending, and that's what we usually look at. They've got another column that's social service spending. And so these are the types of things that go into social service spending, supportive housing, employment programs, nutritional and family support. So these are kind of the makings of a traditional welfare state, if we're being really honest. And I think they are the best proxy we have at an international level for what a country does to try and impact those kind of non-medical determinants. So what we did was we built it into the analysis. So I'm just showing you this as a reminder. This is what we usually think of as the energy put towards developing health in the US. The US looks high, 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 up around 18. Here what we've done is we've stacked social service spending on top of healthcare spending. So the orange bars are social and the blue are healthcare. And so as a total, you see the US kind of moves more into the middle. Doesn't look like such a high spender. But then you might notice that there's one other kind of peculiarity about the US in this data set, which is that the blue bar for US is much larger than the orange bar. And that's really not the same for almost any other country. So we said, wouldn't it be interesting to look at the ratio of blue to orange, essentially? And this is the graph you get when you do that analysis. So this is the ratio of social to health expenditures as a percent of GDP. And you see the US is now the smallest, or has the smallest value in the OECD. So this is interesting. If we kind of summarize that data, it's in the US for every $1 spent on health care, about 90 cents is spent on social services. And you can see how, from a public health perspective, that seems totally skewed. Because remember, I think those social services are what's getting at the 60%. That's the larger leverage point in my mind. In the OECD, we have an inverse relationship. So for every $1 spent on health care, about $2 is spent on social services. And I think this helps unravel what has traditionally been called the American healthcare paradox of high spending and poor outcomes. If you plug it into a regression analysis, you'll find that this ratio actually, it's very interesting, is more predictive of health outcomes than either the health spending or the social service spending alone. So there's something to this allocation in the governance structure that is really important. Um, and so you can see here what it's associated with. And anyone who wants to go check out the paper, it's in quality and safety. And Bradley is the lead author. So I welcome you to do that. So it's been fun. We've been out there kind of talking about this analysis. It's gotten great traction. I think it's made people kind of sit up and maybe, I hope, take social and environmental and behavioral factors more seriously when they think about, from a policy standpoint, where they want to put scarce resources. But the question that we've gotten back continually is, can you replicate this at the state at the state level, right? So inside the US, you've got 50 different allocations. And can this analysis be, can it hold up, essentially? So that's the work we've been doing for the past year with generous funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'll say that creating this ratio is much harder in the US than it is at the OECD level, because you could imagine Texas doesn't necessarily count housing in the same way Rhode Island does, or hospice is in social in one place and health in another place. So it's been really quite a mammoth effort on behalf of a group of no fewer than 10 epidemiologists and biostatisticians at Yale. And this paper that I'm going to show you now is under review at Health Affairs. So hopefully we'll see it there. The shorter answer to can you replicate it is yes, right? So you can go through and you can do the data cleaning and you can create that same ratio of health to social care spending at the states. And so what you see here is a heat map. If you make that ratio for all 50 states and then you divide the 50 into five quintiles, the green here would be, in my normative framework, the good states, the states that invest in a more evidence-based way. The red are the ones who still continue to favor health care um, more prodigiously. 
And so then we can do these things, which are fun, which is you put these heat maps. The left is what you just saw on the previous slide, and the right is just one health outcome, percent of population that's obese, and you see some significant overlap, right? So that Bible Belt area continues to be kind of problematic from a public health standpoint. But I would just caution anyone about being too literal, and I'll come back to that. It's definitely not a one-to-one, -one, right? So Maine on the left-hand side is red, and on the right is yellow. You've got Alaska, uh, Florida, same kind of thing. So it's not that this is, I always like to say, it's a ratio. So you're getting some signal, but you're also getting a lot of noise in here. And I'm always just very clear about, I don't think we should be too literal. I'll say some more. But, so you create the same ratio, you find all these health outcomes, and then you plug it once again into the regression analysis. And the good news, <laughs> if you're us, um, is that it has held up, right? We found the same thing. States with higher ratios of social to health spending have statistically better health outcomes. And because it was the US and we had more robust health outcomes, we were able to see greater association with uh, a larger diversity of health outcomes. So lung cancer, asthma, obesity, um, these things all came out to be, once again, the ratio is more predictive than either health service spending or social service spending alone. So this is the question, right? And this is what I was just trying to get into a moment ago. Um, the question from policymakers in particular has been, oh, Lauren, this is political suicide. You're trying to tell me that we have to move money from health services to social services. So again, it's a ratio. And this is the most literal interpretation that you try and make your ratio different by moving money from top to bottom. And I think the answer, although I'm not averse to that, I think the answer is not necessarily. Um, we can integrate some social stuff into health services and essentially use the dollars that we already have invested in the health service sector, which are, we all know, enormous, to accomplish some of the tasks that are traditionally, have traditionally been accomplished by social services. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about from here on out. I'll say that um, having been around kind of on this circuit of social determinants and kind of funky hippy dippy physicians for a while, there's a lot of work being done in this area now and every time I go and speak someone comes up to me after and says, oh Lauren, you have to hear what you know Galveston, Texas is doing or you have to hear what Hawaii is doing. So we're in this moment of tremendous experimentation I think and so there's a lot of small case studies that are trying things out. What is the best model of integration? How far can we get a health system to go now versus later? Um, and I just feel like it's important to put out there, their case studies, they're small, but there are, I mean, a lot more than dozens of them. I'm drowning in them, and it's not necessarily easy to see them all in one place, but there's a lot happening. And so here I've just tried to lay out a little bit about what some different models might be, so you have a flavor of the range of experimentation. You know, so I'm moving left to right on this slide with left being kind of the lightest lift or the least integration, but it's some integration beyond what health services used to do. And then the far right will be the most robust in my opinion. So, you know, we see a lot of emphasis around case management, patient navigators, care coordination. These are things that really, to my knowledge, 20 years ago, hospitals and health systems were not necessarily doing. It was your job to find your way from the nephrologist to the primary care doc to the cardiologist. And so this is taking seriously, I think, that we've built a system that's inordinately complex and traditionally has not been very patient-centered and trying to take seriously, oh, you can't do that at 7 o'clock on a Tuesday? Okay, let's see how we work around it. I got to meet with the Minimally Disruptive Medicine group this morning and hear more about how this is working, not only through case management, but through some just good primary care and clinical training. Um, another model of integration would be there are some hospitals, clinics, who are offering individual social services, right? So I can use a case from Boston because it's an environment I know well. Boston Medical Center actually has a food pantry on site. And so as opposed to historically saying, okay, Mrs. Jennings, now you need to go across town and make sure you get your fruits and vegetables and they can help you. Now someone can walk the person right down and take care of that on site and make sure that that loop is closed. Then there are all sorts of programmatic partnerships, right? So. Um, medical legal partnerships are a really good example of this. I don't know how familiar folks are, but they are 
programmatic partnerships that are usually contractual in nature and you have a legal aid office or some law firm that's offering pro bono services to help resolve legal difficulties that patients may face that physicians and the clinical team really see as standing in the way of this person being well or being healthy. So good examples are uh, my electricity got shut off. That's something that legal aid can really help with. I'm having trouble with a landlord. I'm having trouble getting child support payments. These are all things that legal services can probably do a lot better than anyone who has traditionally sat in a hospital. And so this model of medical legal partnerships and programmatic partnerships has grown really ex extraordinarily. There's probably 450. I was just at their national summit. I think there are 450 medical legal partnerships now nationwide, um, all built on different funding models and, and different flavors once again. But the core of what a medical legal partnership is, they're thinking hard about it and pushing hard to um, popularize it and see it disseminated. Then you have co-location of services, right? This is like a f kind of a full integration. And I have to say the only place that I've seen this done really well is in the VA. So the VA um, catering to a very specific population with usually a pretty specific profile of needs has been able, especially in New Haven, to take basically all of, the res all of the outpatient resources, I should say, of the VA hospital in New Haven and all of the social services and benefits that they offer, put them in the same building, same staff, same insignia. A veteran needs to go one place and just walk down the hall to get all of those things taken care of and those staffs are in communication on a pretty regular basis about cases and thinking how um, to best support these veterans. And then the last one I would just mention is, uh, to my knowledge, not to be seen in the US, but I put it out here because this is how Scandinavia works, and I think this is how Scandinavia gets the incredible results that it gets for uh, often less money total in terms of health and social investment into of GDP. They do pooled health and social service budgets at the local level. So this means that they divide the country up into counties, and the money comes from the tax base that's fed to the federal government to the local level, and at a local level, government thinks hard and in consultation with a broad range of stakeholders about where they want to put the money. And they're able to tailor pretty closely to the population's needs. So if you're in the Florida of Denmark, you're not investing heavily in education. You're investing in fall prevention. Um, and so they think hard about that. And they have one budget. And they say, OK, we have $100 million. How much do we put in affordable housing? And how much do we put in a new proton beam therapy? Like Those discussions are made explicit in a way that our current fragmentation in the US, health services are over here and social services for the most part over here, there's no explicit negotiation between those unless people fight very, very hard to bring them together. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about one case in particular that I know well because I've visited these places and I've met the leadership and I've talked about how hard it was. It's a small operation run out of St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica, Los Angeles, and OPCC, which is a community center that offers a whole range of social services. Um, their like, bread and butter is homelessness and providing shelter for people who uh, are homeless for whatever reason, but then also women who are fleeing domestic abuse. And so I can play a video, which will enunciate all of the intricacies better, but um, we'll come back to it and we'll talk a little bit about how I think this case is representative of the larger literature out there of other case studies and efforts um, on behalf of social services. So let's see. Everyone cross their fingers. I've never seen an embedded PowerPoint work, but if it's going to work anywhere, it's going to work at the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> it's really difficult to recover from medical problems on the street. For homeless patients, just accessing health care in the first place is very, very difficult. We were seeing that more and more homeless people were older and were developing chronic diseases and they were coming into the hospital. What happens is that a lot of times homeless people would go into the emergency rooms, they'd be medically stabilized, and then because they didn't have a home, they'd be discharged back to the streets and not surprisingly, they would be recycling back through the emergency rooms. What we needed to do was find a way to discharge people from the hospital to home when they had no home. The staff at the Venice Family Clinic has been providing services to homeless clients since the inception of the clinic 42 years ago. But as we would attend various conferences, we'd hear about this whole concept of respite care. We started the respite program because we saw the problem that came up over and over again. They weren't sick enough to be in the hospital and they could just go home and recuperate if they had a home to go to. The respite program helps 
bridge that gap. It's very clear that the respite collaboration has significantly reduced both inpatient and outpatient costs for homeless individuals who had previously not been part of the respite program. There's an 80% reduction in their inpatient stay. So when they come into the emergency room, instead of being admitted, they go back to where they're living. For the first 10 patients we saw as a result of respite, we saved $300,000 over the next year. I still can't believe that worked. All right, so just to make it a little bit more concrete, um, the way that this partnership worked is out of the Community Benefit Office at St. John's, they said, okay, we want to do something around health and discharge, particularly with homeless patients, who at the time, this was 2010 when it started, were also uninsured, so I think there was an economic incentive for the hospital. But they said, let's do something. They purchased space at OPCC. They said, I'd like you to set 12 beds aside. We will pay for the beds, and that will become the respite unit. And we will also fund an on-site nurse who will be there to care for them and do some follow-up care. Um, it also required a change in kind of all the discharge planning procedures. Now, when someone was flagged as someone in the respite care program, there were new calls and kind of management that needed to happen in the ED. So they could get that person to OPCC and not to the street. So it was difficult, but that's more or less what that looked like. Community benefit spending, it's had an ROI for the hospital. The funding went to beds, some um, additional support in the ED for discharge and for the nurse staffing at uh, OPCC, and it's been wildly successful. And so I think that this case is really representative of the larger case base out there in a number of ways especially when you look only at cases that are producing an ROI for hospitals. Here's how they do it. They select a really vulnerable, really high cost population, right? So in this case, it was folks who are homeless and uninsured. That's the ideal population to do something on if you want to save costs, because otherwise you're providing costs and not being reimbursed for them. So there's a lot of work around what are sometimes called frequent flyers or high utilizers. And if you want to save money, that's where to start. I'll say it's a pretty straightforward intervention, right? And time and again, I read these cases, and I feel like that's it. That's all there is. But I was talking to Jerry the other day. That is all there is. Like, there isn't some rocket science around how to keep people healthy. It's people need homes, and they need food, and they need some income, and they need some social support, and they need good health care. And like, if you can put those things together, people do remarkably better. It's a really small-scale evaluation, which is troublesome if you're a researcher. You know, they talked about on the first 10 patients, they saved $300,000. I think that gives you a taste of what their interests were and shows you that they had some financial motivations and are probably making back money. But it's not the kind of thing that you would necessarily go out and publish or that you would want to hang your hat on and go to the senator in California and say this needs to be everywhere. The savings attributed are mostly to decrease utilization, especially of emergency department and ambulatory services. And then it's funded through community benefit. So a lot of this experimentation and a lot of the cases are emerging out of highly mission-driven, so this is a Catholic hospital, nonprofit institutions who have some kind of financial obligation to do community benefit spending in order to retain their tax-exempt status. And so this is the slide that I knew Doug would want to see, and it's a tough slide to do. When you're a hospital administrator or a healthcare administrator thinking about whether or not to step out of the box of traditional healthcare delivery and do some social service stuff, here's what I think is kind of weighing on your mind, and I'm sure people here can help flesh this out for me. There's some costs, right? And the costs are a number of different kinds. You've got some capital costs, so uh, upstart costs. St. John's had to find some beds and buy the beds and move them to OPCC. There's some programmatic costs that are ongoing. They are funding that on-site nurse's salary. It's a new staff member who doesn't sit in the hospital, but they're bankrolling. And then the really big one, and it depends on what hospital you're at, how this works, there's some foregone profit, potentially. And so if you're like a really cynical person who thinks that hospitals are only profit-driven, this is a real concern. And I'll tell you, in the book, we were doing work in Boston, no less, and we spoke to a nurse who said, oh, yeah, well, the hospital will never want to do anything like what you're talking about, Lauren and Betsy. We had an outpatient diabetes clinic that was so successful. I worked there. It was so fulfilling. People got better. It was much less invasive in their lives. And the hospital shut it down because it was losing them money. So this is a real thing that, having been here sometimes, I'm like, maybe Mayo people are just like in the Shangri-La. They forget that, like, in Boston, everyone is talking about the bottom line. Um, but so those would be the three kinds of costs that I think hospitals are weighing. And, of course, whether or not 
foregone utilization is a cost or not depends entirely on like what kind of population you're talking about, what contract structure are you in, what are the regulations, how are you being paid and financed. And then there are these benefits, right? And the benefits also are highly variable and depend on where you are and what kind of institution you're at. So increasingly, I well, let's be real, there's still a lot of states who have a significant uninsured population for whom the cost-benefit analysis would look a lot like it did for St. John's in this case. So I think anytime you have an uninsured population, there's a case to be made. Anytime you have a population where the hospital thinks it gets reimbursed under cost, so a lot of times Medicaid is like this, I think there's still an incentive to try and limit utilization, make the community a sticky place, provide those wraparound services that keep them home. Increasingly, we're seeing this uh, emphasis on readmissions, right? So if readmissions is one of the key performance indicators for a hospital, you know someone's going to come in, but when you discharge them, you do not want them to come back. So there may be a further uh, incentive there to really make the community a sticky place and provide some of these out-of-the-box services. And there are many more that you could probably go to. Those are all kind of hard returns, I would think. Like year over year, you could actually see some financial savings. And then there are all of these soft returns, and I'm sure someone can give me better language for this, but you know, you're going to have a healthier community. You have more affordable housing in the area for your staff and for your employees to live. Improved health, we know that inequality um, and health, uh, poor health determines all sorts of like social capital things. It's probably just a better place to live, easier to recruit and retain staff. Um, and of course, it's central to the mission of many organizations. Maybe all of them, but I'm not sure that it's for in their mind that the mission is always to do health and not health care. So we can talk a little bit more about that. But that's more or less, if I were to talk through a framework of where I think this ROI discussion is, that's where I think it is. If you really push me, my gut is that every hospital has some population of people for whom there is an ROI that it makes sense to do something out of the box. Some population. It's not everyone, but their pockets. And we need to encourage that experimentation because that's going to build the case base and build the evidence base so that we can shove this more into the mainstream. That being said, I think the longer term case, those softer turns have yet to be fully thought through. Mayo is a great place to be talking about it, but um, you know, the question of whether or not all hospitals should become these fully integrated health and social service delivery organizations, I think is still very much on the table. And I would just add that the research base of, uh, okay, I'm going to do a social service intervention or provide a wraparound service and actually see health outcomes is not as robust as we would necessarily like. It's there, but it's often fragmented. Not everyone publishes their work in PubMed. Not everyone publishes their work in health affairs. So it's not always well known by healthcare administrators and decision makers. And it's not always accepted because a lot of those study designs are quite different than what we would expect. They're not RCTs, but guess what? You can't get an RCT on housing through an IRB because it's actually unethical to randomize someone to be homeless. So it's a challenge. All right, I'm getting off here. I just have three key questions for the future. And like I said, these questions are very much alive for me. Um, I don't know the answers. I barely have an instinct on them, but I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. So these are questions if we were imagining the healthcare system that we wanted and we think is somewhat feasible. Here we go. What should we pay healthcare to deliver? And I think this is coming up time and again when we're thinking about value-based financing and what the metrics are for those contracts and what the metrics are for ACOs. Should they be incentivized just to provide high-quality healthcare? That is a totally noble goal, but is it enough for us? Or do we think that they should be incentivized and paid to actually produce health? And the difference on this, of course, is in the first instance, anytime you come in, anytime patients come in and they have their blood pressure checked, the hospital gets paid. If we're incentivizing for health, you can check the blood pressure as much as you want, but you're only going to get paid if that blood pressure goes down. Right? And that's a really big difference. And this is just an open question. If you talk to a lot of healthcare administrators, they say, Lauren, you just told me that I can only really impact 20% of health. Healthcare is 20% of health. Why would I ever sign up to be held accountable for all of health when I know that my leverage point is that small? In Scandinavia and other parts of Western Europe, they've moved to this even more amorphous concept of well-being. What does that look like? How do we measure it? I'm not sure. And who knows? It could be something else entirely. 
um, and the complexity of measurement goes up substantially as you kind of move up this stepwise function. But I think this is really at the fore of policy right now. The second question is, for what population should a hospital be responsible? And this, too, is coming for me straight out of the ACO debates and discussions about how to attribute beneficiaries. Traditionally, I think hospitals considered themselves responsible for those people that walk through the door. Those are our patients. They show up, we take care, and then we discharge. In the ACO model now, we have this assignment, this beneficiary assignment um, strategy. And so they're essentially saying, OK, ACO, you're responsible for all these lives. We're putting you on notice. This is who these people are. Do something about it. And then um, a still more progressive, I think, thought would be, OK, hospital, you're responsible for everyone in this designated geography. And this is how a lot of rural healthcare systems and hospitals work now. They work more or less on a geographic focus. Um, but, you know, in Boston, that would be a nightmare because you've got eight hospitals and who's going to take what geography and, like, that's just waiting for some really interesting gerrymandering. And then this is the final question, and I think this is the question that, um, in some ways, I wanted to try and foreshadow when I was using the two Mayo brothers quotes, right? So what should healthcare's role be in creating health? This is a leadership question. It's a governance question. Here, the natural thing to think about is that healthcare would sit in the middle if we're trying to create community health. And then you have all of these social services and other institutions that basically plug into the effort. But it's schools, it's job training, it's home health, these things. But healthcare really leads. And there are good arguments why this would be the case. We can talk more about them. Um, or the other alternative is someone might say, no, I don't like that strategy at all, Lauren, because when you put healthcare at the middle, then you risk really medicalizing the whole system, right? And continuing to have this like thought that health and healthcare are one and the same, and healthcare has so much power already. These other players are not going to feel like they have a voice or a role to play. So we should put healthcare as a spoke. And a lot of healthcare people, I think, are excited about this thought because they're afraid about being held accountable for health. So they're like, don't hold me accountable. I'm just a spoke. Let me provide high quality clinical care. And then we have all these other players. And the totally open question is, who then sits at the middle? Who calls the meetings? Who buys the coffee? Who manages the budget? Who assigns the tasks? Who is leading that effort? There's a lot of different models being tried right now from nonprofits, insurers. I met with someone from YMCA of America the other day who said, why? It should be right there in the middle. Why is our community institutions? They're well liked. They're well trusted. We won't medicalize. Let us sit there. But it's very, um, it's not clear. Great. I'm out. Look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Thank you. So there are some microphones that are available, so we'd love to hear uh, questions. Um, Lauren would like to hear your answers to her questions. Totally. Uh, for sure. So I don't know if there's anybody who has an immediate answer to the first question, that is, what, what should we be doing? Or gut instinct. I don't need, like, fully formed topic sentences. So it is interesting to me that the Institute of Medicine recently released um, its report about measurement for the future, especially with Medicare moving toward value-based payment. Yeah. And of the 24 measures that are now considered a core measure set, there are now more population health measures. So you get a sense of encouragement that finally we might be having some enlightened, unified approach to policy development at a federal level? I do. And I think, you know, a lot of this stuff is old news. Like, public health people have been talking about this forever. I'll be really encouraged when I see the pay for performance scheme that links dollars and financial incentives to those metrics. Because I think, and unfortunately, this is very pessimistic for someone from Divinity School, but until we put the dollars there, we're not going to see the real full force commitment from the health systems. Over here. <clears throat> that was an excellent talk. Thank you. My question is, uh, do you think healthcare is a uh, basic human right? And how do you think the answer to that question affects the allocation of these funding and how we think about this? Yeah, so uh, my feeling is yes. But I think whether or not it's a human right is kind of besides the point in some ways because it's a, it's a policy decision about whether or not Apart from being a human right, which is kind of a more philosophic discussion, it's a policy decision that we may all make. And it may not necessarily need to be motivated out of a sense of pure altruism, right? It could be motivated, and we were just talking about this earlier, out of a sense of um, much more enlightened self-interest. 
And so you see this with like all the concern about vaccination and anti-vaccination now, right? That, oh, I really do have a stake in the vaccination decisions of my neighbors and my friends and my colleagues because if I have an immunocompromised child, my child's health is really at risk. So I think we see these like interdependencies um, play out in some select areas and we just have to be better at communicating that so that there's a clearer sense in the policy discourse that we all have a vested interest in people being healthy. There's a question here in the middle, David. Let's go over to the far side here first. Yes. Uh, you mentioned states, and are there any states that are actually doing anything in these ways in a statewide uh, uh, fashion? Yeah, there are. There are lots of them, and I'm always nervous to call out some and not others. I think the most obvious is Vermont. So they've gone to this like quasi-single payer place, which I think uh, links to what I was saying about the Aurora Center and the VA being very innovative in this regard. When you go to a single payer or something akin to a single payer, the potential for the returns becomes much clearer. Um, and so they have moved to have like a really robust community health worker program, a lot of wraparound services, investing in bike lanes and sidewalks and this kind of thing. Um, and I'm happy to send you a site afterwards. But I think Vermont is a leader, and then a lot of Pacific Northwest. So Washington and Oregon, again, because I think they have really rural populations, and they've been thinking geographically and kind of in this population health management mindset for a long time, have quickly taken the lead and are using kind of ACO frameworks and adapting them a little bit in Oregon. They're called care coordination organizations, CCOs. Um, to really divvy up the work in a very strategic fashion and take a population health approach. Hi again, thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm wondering if, if some of these models have incorporated patient accountability. We, we know overwhelmingly that uh, much illness is, is related to behavioral choices that patient makes, patients make. And uh, public health initiatives have, have been marginally to somewhat successful, but not overwhelmingly. Yeah. And, and it occurs to me as, as a rehab doctor and someone who's always telling patients to exercise, to be more functional, and being very frustrated in, in having uh, affecting lasting change, are there ways that, again, as long as you put health care in the center, it's OK, do what you want, and then go there, and they'll fix it. Right. Ways that you can make people much more aware of the community and social level repercussions of these choices and, and how do you sort of bring that into the, the mix? Yeah, it's such a good question. It's one that I've struggled with a few times this morning. I've talked to a couple groups and said, you know, this question of how to balance the approach that is, let's integrate the provider side and really be sure that we're doing as much as we can to be accessible and patient-centered on the provider side without losing sight of the individual's role and individual responsibility. Um, and I think the only thing I would say, so to your point, there is definitely a role there. And if Betsy were here, she would say, yeah, we need to see a lot more demand side pull before we think the supp supply side push is going to have a lot of lasting impact. My feeling is uh, there is some gray space in which we should negotiate those roles, but we're so far from having done our part as like providers. I'm not a real provider, but I'm aligning myself with you all. Um, we're so far from having done all that we can that we shouldn't yet sit back and say, see, they missed the appointment. They're non-compliant. I think there's a lot of work that we should do to shore up our own practices and processes before we then say, okay, this person's non-compliant and write them off and say, we failed there and that person is in poor health just because of a lack of personal accountability. Aaron. So along that same lines with the accountability, I couldn't help but think with the ratio of healthcare dollars versus social services and, and to drill down further potentially in the cost per provider mm -hmm. on the social services side and if you would get more providers and a better bang for your buck from the accountability standpoint, if we were to make that shift as well from the patient accountability and establish that rapport, have that follow up uh, on that side of things as well. Yeah. I'm not sure I totally got the full question, but if it's about accountability in the social service sector, I think we have a long way to go. And so this is one argument for putting healthcare at the center of the movement because we think that there is some good accountability, good management practices, good metrics, um, and a culture of accountability in healthcare that may or may not exist in a lot of social services, in part because they've been, I think, historically pretty underfunded. 
They are often nonprofits. They're small shops doing the very best they can. Um, but I think that's why, you know, we were speaking last night at dinner. I think that's one argument for keeping healthcare at the center, even though there is this risk that it will be medicalized and healthcare may not want to be there. You know, any strategy is going to have a downside, and I think those are downsides that we should be willing to take on. But I think it's still the right strategy because of the accountability issue. In the back. So you've been talking about kind of a wheel and spoke model. Are there any models that are just like a jigsaw puzzle where it's one part of the piece and there doesn't need to be one central organization accountable, but each has their own function? Has anybody laid that out well? Yeah. You know, I haven't seen it depicted as a jigsaw, but it's um, a great idea. I think the concern that we had was in a shared accountability model, I think a shared accountability model is a little bit like what we've been in where if you ask someone, you know, who's accountable for your health? Some, set, some subset of people might say, I am. Some subset of people might say, my insurer is Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or whomever. Some might point to their primary care doctor. Some might point somewhere else. Um, and so maybe that's not truly shared, but that's kind of what we were trying to get away from and really thinking about who's going to lead and who's going to really own the task and own the accountability. Because if we're just in this like shared model where everyone has a place to play, blah, 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 then you know we've kind of seen that we all drop the ball. And so I would love to think that we can do a jigsaw puzzle, but I think you would need to see a lot more like activation and investment from a whole set of players who haven't traditionally been at the table. And in order to get them to come, it might be smart to have one like leader voice who says, we're having a meeting at this place at this time. We're going to talk about the health of Rochester. So you get them to the table to begin with. OK. I think maybe it could be, though, we own this portion of this result. So if you look yeah. at child or infant mortality, you say, these are all you know, the determinants that we know about. And you're responsible for making sure that this measure happens on every person in this measure. Yeah. Because there are areas where it may be a break of 60, 20, 20, but you have 5% of that 60, or you have 10% of that 20. I agree. And I think the interesting thing that that leads us to is like uh, almost like a Millennium Development Goals model for cities and counties, right? Where everyone comes together and for once we have a common framework of what we're trying to do. And this is facilitated in part because now the ACA requires these community health needs assessments. So for once now we have some sense of what the priorities are. You could have a meeting around that and really divvy up the work and then track it closely over time. Um, I think that requires some like interesting kind of PR work almost in terms of making it a thing that everyone is really invested in and is getting credit for. But I love that model. I would love to see it tried. So one of the political challenges, of course, is affordability at a state budget level. Yeah. Um, and if we were to spend more money on social services and fundamentally less on health care, then it, somewhere it has to come out of health care. And we traditionally in the U.S. have, I think, agreed that about 30% of all our, our health care spending is waste. Right. Um, why wouldn't we fairly quickly put out an expectation to hospitals and delivery systems, we're going to pay you an amount of money for health and estimate that on what it, we think is reasonable to achieve health and not pay you any more, and the rest we're going to then put into social services. What are the political problems with that approach? <laughs> How long do you have? Uh, well, you know. We have seven minutes. OK. Um, well, I think there are a few. Um, hospitals will tell you that they are doing health, right? So they won't like your characterization of them that they're just doing health care. And so that's a battle when you really get up close and personal about, well, look at our mission. Many of the missions say health, but if you look at the operating budgets, they're pretty clinical. So there's a debate over what they really are doing and just describing the current state. Um, I think there's still a lot of people that think politically social services are just a bad idea, right? That they're the welfare queen is still out there operating, mooching away. They're not evidence-based. Why would you want to in any way enable or support those? Um, then there's like, OK, well, we've been running at this capacity to, to date, serving this many patients. Um, they won't agree that 
my hospital doesn't have 30% waste. The system might have 30% waste, but which hospitals, which patients of mine do you want to deprive services to go give them to the faceless masses? I think that's a real psychological challenge too, that healthcare operates on an individual model more or less, like there are faces and names and patient identification numbers. And so the idea that you would take away from that kind of um, support this like very personal I know who I'm helping to give through a social service model which is much more population based it's much more we're just going to invest in the community but we don't necessarily know who's benefiting from that unless you really do a lot of work um, also poses kind of a psychological barrier to trying to make that shift I'm sure others could give me additional help on this question I mean there's a lot any other thoughts I mean, one of the things that um, has in intrigued me sometimes is that in state budgets, the two big items are usually health care and education. Yeah. And we know that education actually ultimately has a lot to do with health yeah. of a community. Um, but you didn't speak much today about shifting dollars to education. Yeah. The problem with the education literature, so I've been pretty deep in it recently, um, is that it's not clear, on a correlation basis, we know that people who are more educated definitely have better health. Uh, but there has not been a lot of work done that shows us that if you invest in education for one group of people and you don't for another, that their health will be better. So there's no like interventional or there's not much interventional work. And so that has been challenging because, and that research design is incredibly challenging, right? Because you probably need to follow people for 20 years. and no researcher wants to take on that task. <laughs> so whereas the evidence base is stronger, and I think this is where my bias comes through, I, I trend towards where I think the stronger evidence base is for. So income supports, you don't have to follow people that long to see real improvements in their health. Food security, same thing. Housing, same thing. Education, that level of evidence with that kind of rigor just isn't there. So while it's deeply intuitive, and I'm kind of sure that it's true, I put out so much like, wacky stuff that I try and trend towards the things that I only really know the evidence is quite large on, interventionally. Barb. Um, thanks for just an awesome talk, Lauren. Very inspirational and thought-provoking. Um, so when you describe a lot of the experiments and the pilot projects and things that are going on, and perhaps as you end with a bit of a call to action to Mayo Clinic, uh, what are some of your uh, hopes in terms of how Mayo Clinic can help to close some of the gaps and some of the areas that we need to more deeply explore. Yeah, I mean, I actually had a great time reading about a lot of what Mayo does already. You asked this question earlier, and I felt the same way. Like, I don't know what to tell Mayo to do. Mayo is, like, out there doing it. You're a star. So the kinds of things that I would ask for, I guess, as a researcher would be to really evaluate what you are doing and evaluate it closely and disseminate it energetically. Um, I think Mayo has a really interesting, so to finish that point, you know, there was huge investment in affordable housing in Rochester, right? This is like right in the box, in the square of like what I'm thinking a lot of hospitals could be doing, should be doing. Um, I'd love to see an evaluation of that. Quantitative, qualitative, what does it look like? And I would love to see Mayo be out there kind of waving that flag, saying this is the kind of work we're doing. We're not only this like highly specialized center where you can come when no one else has a medical answer, but this is the approach we're taking. And then I think Mayo has a really interesting conception of itself located in the Rochester community as kind of an anchor institution, and I've felt that very strongly while I've been here. Um, and that's very different from a lot of hospitals elsewhere in the country. And I'm not sure that it's replicable everywhere because not every uh, healthcare organization is as large or as well-resourced or um, kind of has the geographic monopoly maybe that Mayo has. But I think that continuing to articulate this vision of a hospital or a healthcare organization that takes on this role of doing more than just healthcare and really seeing yourself uh, deeply embedded in the fabric of the community would also be a tremendous help. Well, Lauren, I want to thank you again for coming. Can we do one? There's one last question. Uh, Go fast. Um, just, just to comment on the spoken wheel. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make the argument that I think healthcare should be in the center, because you've got 20% of healthcare. You've also got 20% of genetics, which is being done in the healthcare field. Yeah. And 
for the exact reason that you say healthcare doesn't want to be accountable? Because it's evidence-based. They look at your evidence, they say, this is why we don't want to be accountable, because we don't have that leverage. That's the kind of people you want in that position. Mm -hmm. You don't want the people that are, okay, we're going to do whatever yeah. without the evidence. That's Doug's point, too, so I'm glad we took that one. <laughs>